All right, before we head in, uh, we are uh, about three weeks away from the launch of the financial modeling module uh, in the applied level. We'll be going through both Costco uh, and CapReit, a U.S. retailer and a Canadian apartment REIT. Uh, and we'll be basically starting from a blank Excel worksheet and building up a full model. And I'll show you uh, shortly what the model looks like so far because, well, I've got to build the whole thing first before uh, we can do anything. Uh, <clears throat> so a couple of things I'll make available to you. Here's uh, Costco's last 10K. We're going to use September uh, 2023, September 3rd. Uh, their next year end is uh, just around the corner. So by the time <clears throat> uh, we're done building up Costco, and projecting out 2024 we will have full year 2024 results and we can look at a variance to see how close were we based on our assumptions and then uh, <clears throat> it gives us the opportunity to show how to update a model uh, when new data comes out um, I'm going to try to make this file available for you. I don't know where uh, I'll post it for download, uh, but it's the 10K and I've highlighted key things that we're going to need to know, key information that we're going to need to know. Uh, I'm going to give you the first few uh, and then uh, hopefully in time, you, you would be going through the 10Ks yourself and determining uh, what, information, uh, what information you would highlight uh, because if I keep giving it to you, uh, well, you'll never actually get to the point where you can pick out what are the important things yourself. Let's have a look at um, <clears throat> the other supporting documents uh, that I'll be providing. Um, there'll be a walkthrough, much like I did with Global Ship Lease. I'll be doing a walkthrough of Costco just so that we can understand the nature of the business we're dealing with. Uh, and in understanding the nature of the business we're dealing with, <clears throat> we can get into a position where we can start to determine what things we need to forecast. So we can see here what our revenue drivers are. Once we identify the revenue drivers, we're in a position to start forecasting uh, revenues. Costco has both membership fees <clears throat> and merchandise fees. So we got to figure out how we're going to model the growth in merchandise fees. Uh, and uh, whenever we're forecasting revenues, we always think about price and quantity. How are we going to forecast price? How are we going to forecast quantity? And what, uh, what assumptions uh, would we need? We don't want to just take a growth rate and say five-year growth rate is this. Let's forecast that into the future because, okay, great. You got a growth rate. What's driving that growth rate? If there are three or four variables driving that growth rate, you want to decompose it into as many of those uh, uh, variables as possible so you can see the effect of each one. So we'll be uh, looking at ways of forecasting membership fees, uh, merchandise revenue, and we always start here. You want to get a good understanding of the business and a good understanding of the drivers so you can understand the assumptions that we're looking for and how we would begin to model this before you even go to a spreadsheet. Uh, you want to have an idea of the data that you would need to determine whether or not uh, you can get that data. Uh, so some examples of how things work uh, if we're forecasting uh, merchandise revenue. Executive members get a 2% reward, so we have to figure out, well, <clears throat> how much is that 2% reward going to come to because that's a liability. So we have to first understand how the liability is created before we can then uh, begin to model how uh, we would uh, account for that liability. Then we go into costs. So you'll be getting that as well. <clears throat> Let's have a look at where I am uh, with the model so far. And uh, keep in mind, uh, you're not getting this. You're going to get a, a blank worksheet and we are going to build this up uh, on our own. Uh, so here is our income statement. We're going to do it all in one, all in one sheet. I've uh, separated them out in separate worksheets to show you what they would look like, but it is brutally difficult to to maintain and audit a model across multiple multiple tabs. Everything really should be in one worksheet, and it should be built like this. Uh, notice if I highlight J, it's 2021. These are the actuals. Uh, everything should be all the way down from our revenue schedule, uh, our, our expenses schedule, everything all the way down should be the same column. <clears throat> and uh, our assumptions should be on a different page. 
and our year should be here. If I change this year, 2024, it changes every year, everywhere uh, to uh, the forecast year. All these always stay the same. And then it's a cut and paste. You hop over four columns and you just have to do this. Actually, you just have to do this. And you cut and paste and it hops over four columns. Uh, and you just simply add your new column. I'm actually making it sound simpler than what it is, but there is a, a way to build up these spreadsheets such that updating becomes super, super easy to do. Uh, you want to try to avoid as much hard coding as you possibly can. Uh, so there is a way to do it, but we will build this whole thing up from scratch. What you see here, everything, whoops, every, everything you see here will not be there. We will uh, do everything. When we get to the revenue schedule, membership revenue for price, we'll have to forecast out uh, price. And it does take a while to forecast out price. A lot of assumptions in here. And then we'll forecast out quantity. And there we go. Look at, look at all the work you got to do before you get to a forecast of membership revenue. And then for merchandise revenue, uh, this is our forecast in, uh, in the uh, solid box here and all the assumptions and all the work you have to do. And in getting this out, we do have to get the accrued members reward. We have to figure out what that is because this belongs in our uh, balance sheet. Where is our balance sheet here? We have to fill in both uh, accrued member rewards and deferred uh, membership fees because of the way that uh, revenue is recognized. In case you thought that this was easy to do, there is so much work on each line item. Uh, but you are going to build this and same with the assumptions page. We're going to build this. We're going to build a scenarios page uh, so that if we just uh, change, uh, we've got a base case running. If we put a best case, all of our uh, forecasts uh, change and everything throughout the whole spreadsheet changes to, to those to those drivers, uh, wh whichever numbers that we put in, uh, put in there. And then we have our assumptions uh, that follow uh, below. Uh, this begins in a couple of weeks. It will be in sector studies uh, in the appropriate folder. So we'll find the Costco model in the Staples folder. We'll find Capri uh, in the real estate folder. If you have uh, the sector studies or the applied level, uh, you, you get this. This is part of the core of the applied level. You don't need any extra fees and there was no deadline for this one. Anybody who has the applied level or sector studies uh, uh, will get this. If you're just interested in, in just the financial modeling, I'm not breaking it out into a separate module. Just pick up sector studies. It's only 220. Uh, and that gives you the ability to upgrade to the full applied level at any time for full credit. If you're level one, level two, or level three CFA candidate, uh, this is a must have. Uh, there is a financial model a modeling module, a practical skills module that CFAI offers, uh, but it uses manufactured data. <clears throat> Most places that offer financial modeling, not all, some of them do have real live companies, but most will use manufactured data. Um, I will never use manufactured data. All of the models we'll be doing over the next several years will all be real companies. Uh, and there'll be a model in every single sector. And uh, the goal ultimately is if there's a sub-industry, there'll be a model in the sub-industry as well. These things do take time to build a good model um, that gets you 80% of the way there, 100 hours at least. Uh, and now what we're doing, we're not doing any quarterlies in this. We're just doing annuals. The next iteration obviously would be quarterlies and uh, of how I'm modeling things. Uh, you may say in time as you follow this company, but I can figure out how to model that a little bit better. Yeah, that's the point, is the more you follow this company, uh, the more you follow the industry, uh, the better you're going to get your model. If, you, if, you, if this is you, where you're going to be an expert in, in three or four years, we'll make this look like a joke. We'll, we'll make this model here look like, like, like you know an undergrad did it as opposed to a grad student. So there we are. Let's, uh, let's head in. Let's begin with the data, economic data from last week, Monday, the conference board uh, leading index, negative 0.6. Previous was negative 0.2. It's been negative for quite some time. However, uh, for the fourth consecutive month, the US LEI has not signaled 
a recession ahead. There are two um, points on this chart to pay attention to. The black, uh, black dashed line is a warning signal and the red line is a recession signal. This is saying it has not signaled recession, which means it hasn't been below the red line. But it is at the warning level, but it's not signaling a recession. It did. Uh, it's never been wrong in terms of recession. Uh, it did signal a recession, and it didn't happen. Um, so many things after the pandemic, indicators that had worked for quite some time no longer seem to work. On the next screen, we'll get the um, non-farm payrolls job revisions. Uh, that's a big one. Tuesday, retail sales out of Mexico. Not uh, not that good. Negative uh, 0.5 month over month. But very, kind of backwards looking. We're looking at June here. Negative 3.9% year over year. Canada got inflation numbers on uh, Tuesday. Uh, core inflation went from negative 0.1 to plus 0.3. And the inflation rate month over month went from negative 0.1 to plus 0.4. The year over year uh, are still fairly good. Core inflation year over year, 1.9 down to 1.7, and 2.7 down to 2.5. This is well below, the core is well below the 2% target. Uh, but, uh, you know, you get a couple more months like that, maybe the Bank of Canada goes on hold. Right now we have 50 basis points of cuts from the Bank of Canada. I think we have three more meetings. Um, there's a belief that you'll get 25 basis points per meeting. Earlier in the year, I had felt that by the end of the year, we would get 100 basis points from Bank of Canada. We're 50 into that with three more meetings. Maybe we get 125 basis points. Wednesday uh, from Canada, PPI, uh, flat. Uh, previous was negative 0.1. Uh, this came in as flat. The forecast was for it to be even more negative. Uh, year over year unchanged. Uh, raw material prices month over month from negative uh, 1.7. The expectation was still negative. Came in at 0.7. Year over year is, uh, is lower though. So base effects playing a role here. But the month over month, we certainly don't want to see several months like that in a row. The big news uh, in uh, economic data last week, the big, big news was, of course, Powell's speech on Friday, but in economic data, was the uh, revisions. And uh, I was uh, on the website clicking refresh, 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 and it just wasn't coming up. And apparently, you find out after that they were late in releasing it, and they had been emailing it. If you, call, if you sent a, a notice in saying, I didn't get it, they just emailed it to you. I guess some banks got it before uh, everyone else did. Negative 818. It's only 0.5%, uh, which is uh, seems like a small amount, but it's quite large. Largest uh, revision since 2009. Uh, manufacturing down 115. Retail trade 129. Professional and business services 358. Leisure and hospitality 150. Some sectors uh, did gain. However, so if we take the 818 divided by the 12 months, this is very backwards looking, by the way. This is as of March 2024. So it's so rear view mirror that eh, other than highlighting that, you know, maybe maybe some of the data we're seeing isn't real data or isn't isn't as exact as we would like it to be. Uh, it's so far in the rear view mirror. I don't think it really matters that much. 800. 818 divided by 12, 68,000 a month. So lower jobs uh, uh, on average per month. Instead of 242 over the prior 12 months to this report, it was 174. 174 times 12, you're still greater than 2 million jobs over the year being uh, being created. Uh, crude oil. Big drawdowns on both oil stocks and gasoline stocks. Uh, expectation was for a drawdown of 2.7 million. It was 4.6 million. And for gasoline, 1 million. It was 1.6 million. Uh, and when these reports came out, WTI went down and uh, RB went down. So CL for uh, the oil contract and RB for the gasoline contract both went down. So I was watching that thinking, well, that's that's sort of the wrong direction. You know, it's... Uh, 
we always think that if you have these reports before they come out, you can make money on it. I would not have shorted. If I had this five minutes before it was released, uh, I would have at a very minimum been long both contracts and would have lost. So sometimes, even if you know what the number is, it may not even help you because it's not really what the number says. It's the reaction to the number. And the reaction on both of these was negative. Thursday, back to Mexico. GDP growth rate year over year. This is the final look at, uh, at, at Q2. Neg uh, sorry, not negative. 2.1%. Uh, Previous downgraded to 1.5. Forecast was for 2.2. Came in light. Economic activity year over year for June. Negative 0.6. Forecast was for 0.9. So that is a fairly big miss. Uh, Mid-month inflation. Uh, we're in deflation for that month. Negative uh, 0.03. The expectation was for 0.12. Uh, and year over year 5.16. Expectation was for 5.31, previous 5.61, so that's coming down nicely. Chicago Fed National Activity Index for the U.S. on Thursday, negative 0.34. The uh, expectation was for a positive 0.03. The previous was negative 0.09, so uh, more acceleration to the downside. Continuing jobless claims, uh, last read was 18.59, up to 18.63. Expectation was for 1870. <clears throat> Less than expected, but still a week over week gain. And initial jobless claims, the expectation was 230, came in at 232. The previous week was 228, so uh, that is lower or a higher initial jobless claims than both last week and the expectation. SP Composite. Um, I don't know that these uh, get paid attention to. The PMIs are are the king of the king of the hill when it comes to uh, uh, to the indexes. Fifty four three to fifty four one uh, was a decrease. It did beat fifty three five. This is for the composite. And then it's broken down into a manufacturing and services. Manufacturing came in lower, both than last month and the expectation, and uh, services came in higher than both last month and the expectation, which has been a trend for a couple of years now. Friday in Canada, retail sales, negative 0.3, uh, right in with expectations. It was negative 0.8 the month before, or the, for, the, uh, for May, for June, negative 0.3. Manufacturing sales month over month for July. This is June, we're moving into July here, up 1.1%. Uh, from being down 2.1%. And retail sales, uh, continuing on with the first report, X autos because it's interest rate sensitive. How is everything else going? Up 0.3. Uh, this uh, previous month was negative 1.2. That's an upgrade to negative 1.2. The expectation was still uh, negative, came in at, um, at 0.3. And then Friday, <clears throat> Powell's speech. I think the big line in there, uh, was his um, uh, his words about the labor market? We 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 won't accept uh, any deterioration in the labor market or any further deterioration. But he has uh, sort of moved away from his inflation uh, focus to the economy focus. The other side of the dual mandate feels that the risks to inflation uh, are lower now than the risks to the economy. So is watching the job market. And I wonder how much of that had to do with the revisions that the economy had not been as strong as previously thought. Still a good economy. I mean, creating 2 million jobs over that 12-month period in the face of rising interest rates. If you go back to uh, end of uh, March 2023 uh, to end of March 2024, you had... Uh, uh, interest rate increases during that period of time, and the economy still created over 2 million jobs. <clears throat> but certainly not the 3 million jobs or the 2.8, 2.9 million jobs uh, that, was, that was believed. So 25 basis point cut for September is pretty much in the books. I think that's 100% uh, probability. Uh, whether we're going to get 50 basis points or not, it doesn't that doesn't feel like it's this fed i think they'll start with 25 starting with 50 out of the gate 
kind of is a negative signal, and I don't think they want to do that. They may go 50 at some future meetings, but I think this first one for September, I think it's a 25, which means some of the reaction that we've seen in the market off the Powell speech, I think, is uh, premature and uh, is going to more than likely retrace. Looking at uh, money market rates, we can start to see the three-month begin to price in a 25 basis point uh, 25 basis point cut in September down eight basis points to 5.25 that is below the effective federal funds rate in fact the two month is uh, nearing the effective federal funds rate of 5.33 uh, the two year 3.9 percent rates down uh, rates and yields down across all the tenors and the only tenor that is higher today than the beginning of the year is the 30 year. Started the year at 403, sitting at 4.1. Uh, curve inversion, almost gone, nine basis points. In the capital market, that's the only curve that's inverted, the two to the 10, nine basis points. 781 days now. I wonder if we'll uh, break 800 days, 19 more days. It can, can it hold a con an inversion for three more weeks? Uh, I, I think it will because I think the market this weekend uh, or the participants will reflect on what they did Friday and think, eh, this is a 25 basis point Fed, not a 50 uh, for September. And they'll start to back out some of these uh, some of these cuts into the end of the year. So I think we'll be inverted for uh, a little while longer. The money market, the capital market inversion, still very deep, 1.44. That's not going to change until you actually start getting cuts. Uh, the three-month will be anchored very closely to the effect of federal funds rate, but it is coming down. Uh, Canada still uh, is uh, inverted. Uh, balance sheet down 37.76 billion. The SOMA ran off 19 billion, so the Fed balance sheet is down 18.7. Down in the uh, securities portfolio, 6.59 trillion money market funds. This is surprising. <clears throat> Increased, still an increase, 24.89 billion, up to 6.24 trillion. Uh, retail up 21.5 billion. Institutions up 3.5 billion, both up on uh, government and just a sort of a flip in prime. Retail up 12.72 billion, prime down, uh, sorry, institution down. 9.7 billion. September FOMC 24 days away and probabilities beginning to shift to a 50 which I think is wrong. It went from 27.5% it's now 36.5% 63 on the 25. Still favoring the market still favoring the 25 but uh, less so than last week. I think uh, this is what we're going to get. And when I say that's what we're going to get, it's not what I believe uh, should happen. It's just given this Fed, this is not a 50 basis point Fed. This is a very careful Fed. They've signaled that it's time uh, to start uh, rate cuts. Uh, I think they'll start with a 25. When they uh, signaled when inflation was really high that it was time to start raising rates, uh, they raised 25 basis points, you know, just a little bit. I think they're going to do the same thing. I think, I think they're going to cut just a little bit, and I think it's 25. So a lot of the euphoria that was priced in on Friday, I think, is going to back out. What are my risk events for the week? Durable goods in one day. <clears throat> uh, not till later in the week do we get uh, interesting stuff. U.S. GDP, second look at second quarter uh, GDP, and first look at gross national income in four days. Followed by Canada, same thing. <clears throat> second quarter GDP, and the preliminary look at July's GDP in five days alongside U.S. PCE. Fed speak this week. Uh, from the time that I did this, the calendar was rather light. It usually fills up. Uh, Wednesday, Waller and Bostick. Thursday, in case you didn't hear him, Bostick will repeat himself. December, going out to the end of the year. <clears throat> uh, more than three rate cuts. Uh, from 60.5% up to 66.2%. And uh, there's pricing in uh, three. There's So the market is saying uh, the idea of one or two, that's gone. There's going to be at least three, 40% uh, 
uh, last week 23.8 so the uh, bets are uh, increasing to being more than three for the year vector federal funds rate still sitting at 5.33 that's not going to come down until uh, the FOMC moves reverse repo down 17.4 billion 312 uh, billion TGA down 54 billion reserves up 20 billion uh, so uh, at runoff of 40 billion looking at 29.3 months what uh, we should pay attention to here is <clears throat> there's 25 billion in US Treasuries in there uh, and 15 billion of mortgage-backed securities although the cap on mortgage-backed securities is higher you could have a faster runoff uh, but why prepay your mortgage <clears throat> if you had a low rate only only to take out another mortgage at a higher rate but once uh, rates start coming down especially uh, mortgage rates once they start coming down you could have this 40 uh, move upwards uh, closer to the cap of 60 uh, being the cap being 20 more on the cap of MBS you could move up to 60 uh, which would accelerate this to about 20 months real rates uh, all from the 5 to the 30 uh, all under 2% and you have a upward sloping uh, upward sloping curve across real rates inflation expectations or break-evens between nominal and real uh, bonds up that seems rather surprising but I think this as I said before I think this is an outcome uh, not an input I don't know that the market positions between nominal and real based on where the break-evens are I think it's just a mathematical result looking at Fed funds futures uh, really pricing in some aggressiveness 195 basis points of cuts in the next four quarters q3 34.5 basis points q4 71 and a half basis points so a little more than four well, I'll call it four rate cuts by the end of the year uh, in three meetings so there's a 25 a 50 and a 25 or 250s in there q1 another uh, 55 basis points uh, Q2 another 34 for 89 in the first six months of 2025 so you get to basically eight uh, if we think a rate cuts 25 basis points eight uh, eight 25 basis point rate cuts in the next 12 quarters um, that's uh, that's aggressive without without significant deterioration in the labor market I think that's aggressive I think 106 is for this Fed if, if this is a bet on the Fed I think it's wrong if this is a bet on the Fed will have no choice because the economy will force their hand uh, yeah I can I can get on board there but if this is just based on the psychology of the Fed the Fed says they're gonna cut here's a hundred this is not a hundred basis point Fed um, this is this is maybe a 50 to 75 into the end of the year on the Fed I seem to think the data will force their hand uh, but uh, we got to take this hundred and say well what are we betting on when we bet on a hundred for TLT uh, what's going on here uh, up 0.97 for the week SPX up 1.45 implied volatility drifting away uh, I think it's overdone I I, I think uh, I'm still uh, over the next few years I still think TLT probably finds its way well above a hundred 130 140 because I I don't I don't think this Fed uh, or any Fed will have any choice <clears throat> given uh, the fiscal situation they'll have no choice but to head to the zero line uh, or crush the economy is simply because the level of debt will just be unaffordable at these level at these rate levels so I'm still long-term bullish on TLT it's just you know if I'm looking at uh, October all the way to October uh, I think the Fed meeting in September is going to be 25 is going to be rather disappointing which does not justify at this point I think a TLT over 100 so I may sell the 102 to 103 calls for October uh, they're paying 97 for the 102s and 77 for the 103s if we have any more strength these premiums improve since I'm long TLT 
I probably will sell some covered calls on this at 102, 103 for October expiration. Not because I, I, I'm looking to lighten my position by that period of time. Just it uh, just seems a little premature, given given the psychology of the Fed. <clears throat> if if I don't sell the calls and I uh, go with the idea that the Fed will have no choice. I have one jobs report between now and September. I got to hope that that jobs report sucks. But if that job report comes in at 190, uh, even 180, anywhere 180, 190, 200, no, I don't think the Fed is going to go uh, 50 basis points. If it comes in under 100,000, because you need about, just because of population growth, I think you need 100 and I forget the number, it was like 120, 130 per month just to keep the unemployment rate constant. Um, <clears throat> if you come in with a bad number, then yeah, you could see you could see uh, 50 basis points uh, for September. But uh, this, this, it doesn't feel like it's going to be a bad report. And this doesn't feel like a 50 basis point Fed. So... Selling the 102, 103s, I think is just it's just money sitting there waiting for me to take. 30-year fixed rate mortgage, 6.46%, <clears throat> only three basis points. But uh, this is just to Thursday. It doesn't have the benefit of uh, Powell on Friday. Over that same period of time, 10-year pullback six. So the spread has increased by three to 260. Going into Friday, this is surprising to me. Uh, Annalee and ABR. This is the right direction here. This is uh, a little wild and crazy. Look at Hovnani and up 18%. Toll Brothers 15, but uh, they did have uh, decent earnings. Pulte up 10%. These are big numbers. And these, I must remind you, are ETFs. And this is a one, <laughs> this is one week. The, these are not stocks. You say 8.21%. Did XHB have good earnings? No, it's a, it's an ETF of a whole bunch of companies same with itb those are uh big numbers and honestly i think overdone uh i think overdone at this point uh i i just i don't believe the data uh, between now and september will give the fed permission to do 50. but again exogenous events happen all the time Something could happen on a Tuesday night in some far part of the corner of the world that causes uh, repercussions all over the globe, and we might have, you know, a hundred basis point cut before the next meeting if it's bad enough. So, I'm saying X exogenous events, no exogenous events. I don't know that there's anything in the data that tells me that the September jobs report is going to be bad. There's evidence, it seems, that the last jobs report was weak because of weather-related effects that will simply reverse with this one. So this one could be um, uncharacteristically strong given the last six months of jobs reports. It could stand out as one of the better ones. So, uh, And the psychology of this Fed is not, is not there. I think this is a little overdone. Uh, it's hard to, to say that I want to be an investor in the home builders at this point in time, uh, given given how much is being priced in on the interest rate front. IYR up 3.66, looking like it wants to get to $100. XLU up 1.32, uh, still performing well. I might lighten up my synthetic. You'll recall I have a $70 synthetic for March 2025. It's had a beautiful run. I set up the synthetic when XLU was low 68s. Where are we now in the 75s? It's had a great run. Speaking of great run, what about Capri? Anybody uh, still in, in that beautiful thing? Uh, I was loading up in the uh, $43 range. We're sitting at 52 in two months. You got a, a roughly about a 20% increase in that stock in over a two-month period, plus a dividend increase from $1.44 a year to $1.50 a year. Uh, not bad. Mortgage apps down 10.1% ending August 16th, or for the week ending August 16th. Existing uh, home sales for July up 1.3% month over month, and this is big. 
new home sales for July up 10.6%. And I must point out that is month over month. These are some big numbers. Uh, Tuesday, we'll get the housing price index for June along with Case, Case Schiller. And Thursday, pending home sales. Overall, these aren't big risk events for the housing market. Uh, we haven't done this for a while. Let's look at Realtor.com, July 2024 uh, trends report. The July 2024 monthly housing market trends report. You've seen this before. This is active listing count. Here's July 2024, just moving straight up well above 2021. The yellow line is 2022, pink line is 2023. There's 2024, but still below pre-pandemic, uh, but uh, up 36.6% year over year uh, over 2023, the pink line down here. Total listing count, uh, again, above the last three years, uh, but uh, still below pre-pandemic. Pending listings, uh, newly listed homes. Uh, this is the seasonal trend. Uh, it peaks in the spring, March, April, May, and then slowly falls into the, uh, into the end of the year. So it is just sitting just above 2023. Uh, inventory change uh, year over year versus pre-pandemic. So the black is year over year and the um, kind of reddish pink is uh, year over year for the U.S. as a whole. Um, year over year up 36.6%, but uh, for pre-pandemic negative 28.7, then you could see what regions south uh, looks like the uh, area with the most supply up 47.6% year over year down only 14.9 uh, pre-pandemic and same with the west down 19.4 and inventory up 35.4 the uh, northeast <clears throat> looks like the uh, less active area still down well over 50 percent versus pre-pandemic and up only 14.7 percent year over year uh, days on market uh, five days longer uh, year over year than last year uh, just a little under 50 days uh, but uh, this is all pre-pandemic over here. It was taken anywhere from 55 to 60 days. We're sitting, it looks like 49 days here. So still are moving faster than pre-pandemic, but certainly uh, nowhere near what we had uh, for the last three years. And at this point in time, going down to July, had just a little over 30 days for 2021, 2022. The houses were moving. Lots of news in robo taxi uh, industry land last week cruise will now uh, join the uber platform uh, starting in 2025 cruise will dispatch some of its trouble ridden robo taxis to join uber's ride hailing service from the independent uber will offer driverless rides to users as soon as next year uh, with cruise gm on the news did very well uh, up 4.41% on Friday. The news came out Thursday after the close. Up 4.41% on Friday, 48.51. You'll recall as it was dropping. From earnings, I was selling puts at 48, 47, 46, 45, for all the way down, <clears throat> including uh, in the uh, peak of the volatility, uh, doing strips all the way down to 32. Uh, and when volatility disappeared and it started recovering. I closed those strips. And as uh, premium disappeared in the puts, the 40s, the 41s, the 42s for September, no point keeping them open. I've closed them. I have now closed all the puts. Uh, thank you very much, GM. That was a beautiful three weeks. Uh, I uh, made enough off of GM to probably buy one of their more lower priced vehicles. So thank you very much without ever uh, having to own any of those shares. Uh, I am still long GM though. I still have uh, some shares of GM because as it was dropping, I was not only just selling puts, but I thought, well, I may as well buy at the same time. So uh, very happy with GM this year. <clears throat> uh, I also bought 40 uh, for Tesla, 40 December 220 puts, average price of 2505. <clears throat> it's about $100,000 bet, uh, <clears throat> 220 puts. It, um, it, uh, it just doesn't look good for Tesla. They're reminding me more and more of BlackBerry in 2008. 
Uh, let's just have a look at what's going on in this uh, in this industry here. Waymo is now up to 100,000 paid rides per week, and they are also on Uber. If there's going to be a robo-taxi platform, it's going to be Uber. They're in 140 countries uh, worldwide. Uh, I got a whole bunch of other um, headlines that are up here uh, from Autoblog. Uh, Waymo's new purpose-built robo-taxi that's made by a Chinese Tesla rival. Uh, Waymo's new sixth generation robo-taxi features fewer sensors in a bid to reduce production costs. <clears throat> Alphabet's Waymo robo-taxi unit doubles its paid rides in three months. That's the 100,000. In three months, doubled it. Uh, Google's Waymo now obviously the leader in self-driving cars. Uh, and a couple that were on the same page here regarding Tesla. Tesla drivers say new self-driving update is repeatedly running red lights and distracted Elon Musk is letting other EV makers take Tesla's crown. Uh, Europe, July EV sales, <clears throat> number one, BMW, up 35% year over year, 14,869 units. Tesla down 16% year over year, 14,561 units. Uh, BMW is now the number one seller uh, in, in Europe. <clears throat> Um, back to robo taxis. Baidu monthly average of two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred rides at a hundred thousand a week. Uh, Google or Waymo's at four hundred thousand. They're sitting at two eighty-seven. <clears throat> there is uh, across the world some forty, fifty robo taxi businesses that are out there. Uh, Tesla is really, really late to the party. And what doesn't help Tesla is, I guess earlier this week, they've been deleting uh, anything on their site relating to the promises they made to um, car buyers from 2016 that every car was equipped uh, with the hardware necessary for full self-driving. Uh, that is no longer true with where um, the FSD version is uh, from Tesla now. So they're, they're trying to get rid of all that stuff. <clears throat> The uh, what motivates me to do this is all the characteristics of Tesla in 2024 feel like BlackBerry in 2008, which is why I shorted BlackBerry at 130 bucks <clears throat> at the height uh, uh, of their popularity, uh, of which I was uh, you know laughed at and called names for that, but that's okay. Uh, quality control issues. Uh, you're hearing this more with Tesla and J.D. Power ranks uh, out of 50 vehicles. J.D. Power ranks Tesla in the 40 to 50 range almost consistently. Quality control issues. If you remember the BlackBerry Torch, how awful that thing was uh, rushed to market, <clears throat> much like the Cybertruck was rushed to market. Rushed to market because they had to have some kind of uh, competitive response. Their product cycles were really slow. Um, and the torch quickly got the name the BlackBerry Torture. I had a torch. Oh, what a piece of shit. This thing was awful. Uh, I had it for a couple of days. I brought it back. I don't want this. Every, <laughs> when I was bringing it back, everyone was bringing theirs back. It was, it was just a lineup of people returning the torture. Uh, product delays. Uh, RIM was, uh, at the time it was called RIM, R-I-M-M was their ticker. Uh, they had 24 month lead time on any new product. Apple was turning over the iPhone about every eight months. Apple was introducing a new, a new model. Uh, and uh, RIM didn't speed up, S -s still took uh, that much time to do it. You also had a distracted CEO at the time uh, who was very concerned about buying an NHL team for Hamilton. Uh, and uh, distracted him. He was spending money and looking at other things, distracted him from the business. And you sort of have that going on uh, clearly with Musk and X right now and uh, his fascination uh, with uh, Trump and I guess wanting to be, you know, something in Trump's cabinet or uh, do something in the administration. <clears throat> so it feels too much uh, like what we had in uh, 2008. And in 2008, you couldn't tell somebody uh, that the BlackBerry was dead. Uh, it was called the CrackBerry. Obama had one. He just, uh, uh, you know, uh, had, uh, uh, you know, risen to a lot of fame late in that year. And there was talk about him not wanting to give up his BlackBerry, even though for security reasons he had to. It was hitting on all cylinders at that time. But, 
the the uh, iPhone was out and there were other uh, companies releasing releasing it at the time. Just uh, their quality control, their product delays. Uh, the CEO, this was enough to say, look, it's uh, they're not going to make it. Plus, they didn't really have the cash to go up against a fight <clears throat> uh, with Apple uh, or even Nokia. Nokia had six times more cash on their balance sheet than Rim. Rim was only sitting on a billion dollars. You're not going to win a fight against Apple, which had you know multiples of that. So I think that's where we are with Tesla. Uh, so let's make uh, let's make a significant bet on it at this time. Still on the theme of a little overdone, let's have a look at the U.S. dollar, uh, the DX, the U.S. dollar index, uh, in June 26th, 105.7, uh, August 23rd, 100.56. That's a huge drop uh, over a two-month period. Uh, this last low was at 100. We're sitting at 100.565. This is zoomed in for one week. There is Powell uh, speaking there. Uh, I think this is a little overdone. Uh, I don't think we're going to get the rapid uh, cuts that, uh, that the market seems to think we're going to get from this Fed if it were up to this Fed. Uh, which means you'd have to be betting on a significant deterioration of the economy for the Fed to move faster than what I think they will. So I think this is overdone. Uh, and I was watching it on, on Friday, especially the Canadian dollar, peaked below 135 for a bit, and I thought, this, 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 is, uh, this is a little overdone here. What's going to happen? Like, you know, we got to start thinking, uh, well, what if, what if you have a continual deterioration of the U.S. dollar? Uh, what do you want to do? First thing we have to think about is, well, what, what will happen in the U.S. market? Because what you're going to get with the yen is you're going to get an increase in the value of the yen. So the yen will go up, the U.S. dollar will go down. I have two arguments for what could possibly happen. Uh, and I don't know which one is going to win out. Uh, you simply just have to watch, <clears throat> watch the fallout. The um, the if the carry trade is between the yen and other currencies, probably nothing is going to happen, because while the yen is strengthening, every other currency is strengthening as well, uh, which would mean that the carry trade is still intact between the yen and other currencies, because they'd be strengthening. Along with, uh, along with the yen, which means that the yen other currency exchange rate might be fairly stable. But if the carry trade uh, is from the yen to the U.S., if any of it is in the U.S., this is, this is going to hurt twice as hard because you have a deteriorating U.S. dollar with a rising yen. So maybe, maybe there's some carry trade unwinding coming. You would have thought it would have been Friday with the big move you had Friday. If there was anything there, you would have thought there would have been some unwinding on Friday. But markets were strong, very strong. Uh, yields were actually lower uh, in the capital markets. Rates were lower in the money market. So it didn't feel like money was leaving there. So I don't know. Big question mark on uh, what to expect going forward here if we continue to get uh, weakness especially if you break 100. <clears throat> the other argument is the S&P 500 is becoming cheaper in other currencies. So we have a market in the U.S. dollars that's pushing, what, 22 times forward earnings. Uh, but if the U.S. dollar is decreasing for a U.S. investor, the market is still 22 times forward earnings. <clears throat> it still costs $5,600 uh, on the index. But in other currencies... As the U.S. dollar weakens and other currencies strengthen, the relative cost, meaning the Canadian dollar cost uh, of the S&P 500 is actually decreasing. Sorry about that, but uh, my uh, all my a Apple devices want to go off at the same time when it tells me how much screen time I've used last week. <clears throat> so just to give you an example... Here, let's, uh, let's just take the changing currency. One week ago, the, the Canadian dollar was sitting at 136.82, or I should say the U.S. dollar in Canadian dollar terms was 1.3682. Uh, now it's 135.10. So if we take the closing price of the S&P 
500 on Friday. Uh, and if there was no currency change, it would have cost 77.09 Canadian uh, for the index. But because of the currency change, it now costs 76.12. So in Canadian dollars, the S&P 500 is actually 1.26% cheaper. So even though it went up one point some odd percent um, week over week for a Canadian, there was no change in price for the S&P 500 index because it went up in price, but the Canadian dollar increased in value, which uh, decreased the Canadian cost of it basically unchanged. So if you have a weakening uh, U.S. dollar, you could have a rising S&P 500 because in other currencies, it's becoming a cheaper and cheaper market. So you get uh, a U.S. dollar that weakens week after week after week. Uh, you could see the same thing you had in Japan, where you had a yen that was weakening, but its stock market was going, uh, was going up significantly. Why? Uh, because in other countries' currencies, it was a really cheap market to buy because you could buy so much yen uh, with, with uh, uh, your currency. So it ended up being a, a cheap place, a cheap market to buy. You could get the S&P 500 uh, <clears throat> on a continual weakness of the U.S. dollar uh, being supported on the way up, which means end of year price of uh, 6000 on the index might be low. You might get 62, 63, 64 if you get prolonged U.S. dollar weakness. That's the other argument. Which argument is it going to be? Is it going to be the argument that a weakening U.S. dollar is going to unwind some carry trade that happens to be sitting in the U.S.? Big question mark there because we don't know how much of the carry trade is in the U.S. But we do know this. A weakening uh, U.S. dollar will make the S&P 500 cheaper in other countries' currencies. The counter to that is, but hang on a second, my friend. Uh, let's say you do buy the S&P 500 and the U.S. dollar continues to weaken. Uh, by the time you sell uh, that S&P, whatever gain you got in the market could have been taken away by the currency. You would have to hedge the currency, but it's expensive to hedge currencies right now. I'm going to show you on the next screen how to negate uh, that problem, how to benefit twice from a weakening U.S. dollar if you're taking your foreign currency and buying the U.S., uh, which just bolsters the positions I have even more. So a weaker U.S. dollar is going to make um, commodity prices higher because commodity prices are denominated in U.S. dollars. So to keep the price of oil constant or the price of gold constant in Canadian dollars, uh, as the U.S. dollar weakens, the price of gold would have to increase. Uh, therefore, when you exchange it into Canadian dollars, it basically hasn't moved. So it's going to support commodity prices. So if you have commodity, U.S.-based commodity producers, they should do fairly well. Let's test that. Here's the dollar index. Here's Oxy. Here's Freeport. Here's the price of copper. And let's all line it up to Friday at 10 when the U.S. dollar just tanked and look what it did it dropped it then rallied and then dropped again and went sideways have a look at oxy as the u.s dollar was dropping oxy was rising as the u.s dollar rallied oxy dropped you can line them right up it's almost perfect uh, so if i were going to take canadian dollars and buy U.S. dollars and buy the market, <clears throat> I wouldn't buy the market. I would buy sectors. I would buy materials and, and um, uh, energy because the prices of the companies uh, will be tightly correlated to the price of their output, which is commodities, will be tightly correlated, negatively correlated, I should say, to the U.S. dollar. Have a look at Freeport. You see the same, you see the same pattern in here. Have a look at copper. Again, same pattern in here. It's going to be the opposite of whatever the U.S. dollar does. So if we expect more U.S. dollar weakness, look for copper and oil prices uh, to go up. Look for Freeport and Oxy to go up. This will only work with U.S.-based companies because their functional currency must be the U.S. dollar. 
such that there are no translation gains or losses on the income statement. Their functional currency must be the U.S. dollar. You will get higher commodity prices from a lower U.S. dollar, which means you'll get higher U.S.-based commodity producer prices. So <clears throat> I am uh, I have puts on Oxy, but no position. I have puts on Oxy. I am long Freeport, and I have puts on Freeport. And I did have puts on copper, but I did close those. Uh, so a U.S. A, a lowering of the U.S. dollar has helped all all of those positions, and is helping Freeport nicely. Uh, if there's continued decline in the U.S. dollar, I'm in the right places already. Not only that, I do have lots of exposure to Canadian apartment REITs, so I am long the Canadian uh, by definition. And since I need U.S. dollars now more than I need Canadian dollars, I am inherently short, U, uh, short uh, U.S. dollars. Just the uh, cap REIT position alone, uh, again, I've said has gone from mid-43s to 52, has raised its dividend, and when I uh, entered at 43, the Canadian dollar was sitting around 1.37 to 1.38. We're sitting at 1.35 right now, so I can buy a hell of a lot more U.S. dollars. So this position has won in three ways. It won on the move up. Remember, I had sold a whole bunch of puts on this one, so I won on all the puts. The dividend increased, I won there, and winning on the currency. Uh, winning on long FCX, winning on the currency there. It's going to help utilities as well. Uh, the lower uh, lower rates in the U.S. Is, is helping utilities. I don't know. I, uh, I seem to be <laughs> doing quite well on all of these. It's been a good week, but I think it's overdone. I think my good week is probably going to give back next week. I think in reflection, we're going to look at the move in the U.S. dollar and say the expectation of the moves. If we think logically about what the Fed will do with only one jobs report in between now and a rate cut, it's going to be 25. It, it just doesn't justify this big move in the U.S. dollar. We're pricing in 200. That 200 basis points are guaranteed going to happen. Uh, I think it's a little overdone. I think yields on the long end of the curve are gotten a little ahead of themselves. Uh, and I think the U.S. dollar has gotten a little ahead of itself. So I think a natural thing, like I said, TLT. I'd be looking to sell calls on TLT. Um, I think I'm going to get some retracement here. So yeah, it was a nice Friday. I didn't take any money on this and I didn't do anything else on this. But it was a nice Friday. It was nice. I think by end of Monday, end of Tuesday, I'll have given back uh, some part of that. I would look for a retracement of the U.S. dollar uh, upwards and a move uh, on TLT down. Okay, new positions. <clears throat> this is the last week for new positions. And uh, many of my positions, I think, are getting near the end of their cycle. Uh, these were great positions to have given the cycle that we were in, but if we're moving into a rate cutting uh, regime uh, while the economy holds up, then you got to start shifting into other sectors. So uh, I might be near the end of the watch lists that I currently have. I might have to cycle some new names into here from some different sectors going forward. Uh, as I said, I closed my GM puts, all worked out. Uh, most of them had very minimal value. Uh, so for the uh, amount of capital that was being tied up with the minimum amount of premium, it didn't make sense. I'll see where GM finds a home, and I think it might be worth selling puts at higher strike prices. Uh, Goodyear Tire, I uh, sold the $9 put and the $8 call. I got a 75, $175 uh, for this one. This is October. These are all Octobers. And I also did the $10 put, $9 call. I got $1.84. I did 30 contracts, well, 60 basically, because it's 30, 30, 30, 30, so 60 on each one. Um, if they're put to me, my average price, if these are put to me, my average price will be 175. If they're called, uh, my average call price is 975, which still puts me at a loss, uh, but certainly uh, a better loss than uh, when it was $7.70, $7.60. Uh, certainly a better loss than then. I don't know that we that it can get to 975 on its own. It seems to have trouble. Uh, uh, it's in the $8 range. Looks like it wants wants to 
you know kind of stay under nine dollars for a while this one here gets put to me at 816 I'd pick up another 3,000 shares at 816 or call the way at 1084 there is uh, getting closer to the break-even point uh, so I've added that on Goodyear <clears throat> I've uh, uh, like I said a couple of weeks ago when they were under eight bucks I said I don't really know what I want to do with them I reviewed their quarterly report and their plan for cost reduction and debt reduction uh, and it's well underway uh, their off-road tire division has been sold uh, that's a done deal uh, there's a billion dollars there and the cost savings that they want to achieve uh, are well underway I didn't see anything that would make me think they're not going to make it so that's why I uh, have no problem staying in this one Lamb Weston I closed my $60 put rolled it up to October 65 put it had uh, two upgrades last week to overweight uh, my average price on my long position is now 65.92, uh, and Lamb Wesson closed at 62.69. So I'm uh, about three dollars and thirty cents below my break-even. Contrast that with a couple of days after earnings, when Lamb Wesson was sitting about 55, and my 72.50 puts were put to me at an average price of 71. I was sitting on a 16 dollar a share loss. Now looking at $3.30, that's not counting the premium I got from the 65 puts. We rise above 65 and it's called away from me. I actually end up walking away with a small, not big, but small little profit on that. But uh, when you think about $1,600 per board lot uh, loss uh, on Lamb Weston, that is not bad. This is, uh, you know, for some critics... Uh, of the strategy that I have that says why not just move on like just you take your loss move on uh, but I've gone from $16 a share loss to $3.30 a share right now based on where the prices are um, so that's an improvement of $12.70 per share could I have uh, left it what has it been four weeks five weeks now could I have left it five weeks ago and found something else that increased by $12.70 a share over that period of time that's questionable, uh, not without you know making a wild bet on something. So going from you know negative sixty thousand uh, dollars to negative ten thousand dollars in a loss is the same as going from zero to positive fifty thousand somewhere else. It's the same thing, right? And I believed it was overdone. Uh, so by October, I think uh, I probably uh, you know will be out of Lamb Weston uh, at at a, a profit and, and and you know by that time I may not even want to get out I may say you know now's the time to stay in XLU uh, it's been very very good to me uh, I have the March 2025 $70 synthetic and I set that up when uh, uh, XLU was 68 and change so I did get a credit uh, on this one I may lighten up on some of that synthetic this week um, 76 seems to be a point of resistance on XLU. I don't know if we're ready right now for XLU to really break out to new highs. Uh, everything seems to just move so fast these days that you get to undervalued, to fairly valued, to overvalued so fast. Um, not that I think that XLU is overvalued. It is the sum of all of its components, but it's been a good run. I'm sitting on, uh, on some good money. Uh, I may lighten up. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to see how, how rates uh, and yields play out this week. Uh, but if, if we have even uh, uh, more upward movement in XLU because rates are going lower on more and more expectations of more and more cuts by the end of the year, I know that that is wrong. I probably will lighten up. Going uh, into Canada, Minto and interrent I sold about five percent each of Minto and interrent um, they're just not performing as well as uh, as well as I would have liked Capri was my number one bet in Canada by far uh, it, it it just had the best value proposition but you want to be diversified Eh, not that great I'm not that impressed with the price action on either Minto or interrent I sold five percent I'll probably continue to sell more uh, they, they pay a dividend, but the dividend yield is low. They are uh, below their net asset value, but it is Canada, IFRS. 
So they're listed at fair value. You have to believe fair value. If you don't believe fair value, you think it's something lower, then the discount from that asset value is not as great as what you thought it was. And I don't know, their price action hasn't uh, hasn't been that impressive. Uh, from you know, from my <laughs> from my point of view, and there's no options on these guys, so I probably will continue to lighten up, only because it's there better there's a better place to be. Cap rate. Uh, I am now down to 56,800 shares from 64,000 shares. <clears throat> As it's going up, uh, I'm hoping to reduce uh, my exposure. Uh, I, I have a position that's way too large to begin with, but it was hanging around 43 for too long, and I kept buying more shares just almost out of anger. It's like, fine, I'll take it. Uh, dividend was raised uh, 144 to 150. I sold 36 $52 calls, average price of $77. We're sitting just a little under $52 now. Net asset value of $56.40. We're 7.8% below the net asset value. And again, that's net asset value based on fair value of the assets, uh, which is model derived. You have to believe the fair value. Uh, I think at fair value, uh, at, at NAV, you're, you're buying a fairly valued uh, um, business I don't. I don't want to own. I don't want to buy fair value, right? I want to steal it. Uh, my target is to have twenty-five thousand shares by the time we get to the fifty-four, fifty-five dollar range. If you're wondering why I sold thirty-six, it's because that's all I got. <laughs> you put a bid out. I was trying to get a hundred. Uh, selling cap rate. Uh, if I tried to sell fifty-six thousand shares at a certain price, I'd never get it. You can't print uh, very big numbers. Uh, you know, thousand, two thousand at a time. That's about it. Uh, the most efficient way to sell shares of this company is to sell calls. So if it uh, continues to increase, if we get to 54, 55 range, I'll probably start selling 52, uh, $52 calls, like in the money calls to sell my position as opposed to selling it in the market. But I want to get down to 25,000 shares. I got 56. So 31,000 shares I will decrease by the time we get to 54 to 55 because I want to as the price is going up the value of your position goes up the proportion that it represents of your portfolio goes up and I want to get under two percent so I have to I have to lighten up that does not mean that I'm changing my view on uh, on the prospects of Canadian apartment REITs uh, it's just this doesn't offer me this is not moving the way I'd like it to move low dividend and no options. Uh, cap rate does have options. I will stay in this 25 for a long period of time because of the options. Uh, one of the more successful Canadian trades I've made was Northview Apartment REITs way back before it got taken out. Owned it at 16 and I owned it all the way through. Uh, the amount of money I made off, off the options, uh, I was able to more than double that dividend, triple uh, that dividend even and 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 get the price increase on the way up I think I could do the same thing with Capri is I can easily double that dividend the dividend now is like 2.2.8 percent something like that uh, not much but I can easily double even triple that dividend uh, while still holding it because it does have options they're not the most liquid options they're what I'd say liquid-ish um, uh, kind of like Hotel California options. These these are uh, uh, options I refer to that, yeah, you can get in. It's probably easy to get in, but, you know, you're not getting out if you have to. So you can check in any time, but you can never leave. Uh, I don't plan to leave them. If I sell puts, it's because I plan to have them put to me. And if I sell calls, it's because I'm okay with the shares being called away. So it ends up being a beautiful uh, basis on which to uh, do short strangles on uh, once you get closer to net asset value. So I will hold the 25,000 shares for a long period of time. It's just 56 is a little too much. It's, you know, as we approach its net asset value, it's time to right size that position. Uh, short, I'm short Tesla. Long puts December 2024 at 220, average price 2505. IWM. Um, short shares at 217.87 uh, because again I think I think Friday was a little overdone 
I think Friday was uh, some euphoria combined with the shorts saying, okay, game's over, let's get out. And I think a lot of Friday, um, let's say half of, of Friday's game, not a lot, half of Friday's game was probably uh, demand for, uh, for uh, short covering. Uh, ES, I'm still short my ES position. I have uh, traded options in and around the ES position such that uh, I'm in a gain position, even if I take the loss on ES, I'm in a gain, but why? Uh, when you have the underlying, the options become less risky to use. The options actually lower your risk, and I'm making money on the options. I'm going to roll the ES Septembers to Decembers. I don't know when, but I'm going to roll them. You get a pickup of 51 points, and those 51 points isn't this point in time. Um, it's it's constant, right? Because... Uh, the it's the difference between a September expiration and a December expiration so being that this is constant those 51 points belong to this period of time um, I'll roll it probably closer to the expiration date but I am gonna roll them to December I'm not gonna close them I'm gonna keep them and roll them I get a pick pickup of 51 points so if you can get a pickup of 51 points it's it's 51 points for free if you're short you have positive carry on that so I'll take it. Uh, things that I'm watching, TD uh, earnings were, um, if you just look at earnings because of the one-time events, pretty bad. Uh, but if you remove the one-time events, it's still a good franchise. I'll sell puts 78 or lower on weakness. Uh, it did drop down last week, um, but it's an event. It's not a recurring thing. It's an event. So uh, let's see where it finds a home. It's in low 80s right now, 80.8. 280.3 uh, if I see any weakness any concern this week on TD uh, I I don't mind owning that for the long term I'll sell 78 puts or lower on any weakness CAD US I may ha hedge the CAD positions against the US if I see uh, the contract 7450 to 75 I think we're 0 0.74 74 is 0.7410 we're in this region somewhere uh, this means that one Canadian dollar gets 74 cents US once you get to 74.5 or 75 that's about uh, this is 1.33 if you think better the other way we're sitting at 1.3510 right now get down to 1.33 that's the upper range here at the 75 again I think it's just a little too much Canada is in a far weaker position uh, than the U.S. Uh, at 139, I would have gone long the Canadian. I said that before, but at 133, I think I'd want to go short the Canadian. Uh, so I'm looking at, at that one. U.S. Yen, uh, 144.38 right now. Uh, I think there is cause for some concern below 141. That's a 52-week low uh, on the pair. 52-week low. When I say low, that means the U.S. dollar against the yen is at a 52-week low. Or said the other way, that's a 52-week high for the yen against the U.S. dollar. Get below 141. Uh, any carry trade over the last year is now, uh, in terms of currency, is now underwater. Uh, as soon as you break 141, that's the last 12 months of carry trades are, are underwater uh, at that price. I don't know what kind of effect it's going to have, and I don't know if it'll have a U.S. effect or if it'll primarily have a, um, a peso effect. It has had a peso effect. Uh, we know that because that seemed to be the most logical carry trade is, uh, from, is from the yen uh, to the peso. Uh, the peso had strength for quite some time with 11% money market yields, and the yen had weakness for some time with no money market yield. That You couldn't get a better, a better spread than that. Bank of Mexico, uh, a central bank, has been cutting interest rates. Uh, Japan's moving in the other direction. You know, so I don't know. This one here is a big question mark for me because I don't know what the fallout from this one will be. But once we get to 141 or lower, 144.38, you continue with U.S. weakness. You continue with uh, the this below 141. I think it's cause for concern. I think it's cause for heightened uh, awareness of what's going on. Uh, but I, I, I couldn't tell you 
what the result will be. So that's an interesting game. Um, this is the last week uh, in uh, for YouTube uh, for new positions. They now move uh, starting next week. They will move uh, purely to the uh, applied level. So any subscriber as of July 31st uh, will get this. It will be in portfolio uh, portfolio construction module. Will be a new module in there called uh, new positions, and it'll be in there. And when I describe the new positions, I'll describe them uh, in in some extra in some extra detail uh, as well. SPY, the all-time high, 564.40. That was July 16th. We're just a smidgen below that 0.38% below an all-time high. 562.23 versus 564.40. Uh, That's basically 20 points up on the S&P index. 20 points. You have a 30, 40-point date, and uh, you have new all-time highs. If you have a weakening... US dollar I think you can get there. Forward four quarter operating earnings 25961 LSEG 25709 SP Global take the average of the two SP uh, closing price SPX closing price 5634 gives us 21.8 times a forward multiple 21.8 Um interesting thought I had over the weekend is what if I adjusted for cash? Like what if I took uh, all the cash on all the balance sheets uh, off because when you're buying a stock, part of the market capitalization is the cash that you're buying, right? What What is the franchise value of the company? So if you looked at Apple, you'd say, well, how much would I pay for Apple? Not how much would I pay for Apple plus a whole pile of cash, but what would I pay for Apple? I don't know if that's being done. If anyone knows of a, a forward multiple on a cash adjusted basis where cash is removed from the market capitalization of the S&P 500 what would be the forward multiple for the franchise um, it could be that we have a 21.8 times forward multiple because maybe there's three multiples in there that are just cash uh, and that we're actually sitting at 18.8 it could be and and so you'd look at that and you say well that starts to make a little bit more sense if that is if that is the case. The other thing that would be interesting is uh, if we look at the S&P 500 and we look at asset value, uh, we know that companies are sitting on real estate, right? They're sitting on land and they're sitting on buildings. Uh, and these are listed at historical value. Well, is the fair value of those higher today? Because we know that property prices are, are higher over time. So if you adjust for the fair value of the land and the buildings and you adjust for cash we might be sitting at a 17 times forward multiple for the franchise could you have said that at any other time when you look at money market funds with 6.24 trillion dollars in there i have to believe that a lot of the uh, a lot of the money sitting on uh, corporate balance sheets in cash and cash equivalents some of that might be in that 6.24 trillion I don't know. Um, so at previous points in time, did you have these record highs on, on money market funds? Probably not. Uh, and if we look at property values, uh, you know, 90s, 2000, and we've basically done this. So we haven't had these massive increases in fair value. There could be something there. I don't know. Just uh, putting that out there as uh, if anyone has any research on the index being adjusted for the excess in, access, in asset value that is not being captured. You'd obviously strip out cash and reassess the value of any land you're sitting on. Uh, surprise factor, 4.6%. Uh, just going back to this, 21.8. You still have to live with 21.8. Last week was 21.54. It is, it is a, rich, a rich forward multiple. Uh, implied volatility not completely disappearing, but uh, easing. Uh, somewhat. 50-day um, moving average, 547.29. That's 2.66% down from where we are. The 200-day moving average is now at 508. That is 9.56% down from where we are. Um, look at this recovery. Uh, I thought the Vs were over, right? Yeah, V-shaped recovery on that one. 
Um, so <clears throat> technical analysts might be saying, well, what have we got here? Uh, you know, is there a potential here uh, for resistance? Because it is the last, it, it's the last top. Uh, in which case, if it fails, maybe you do have that uh, that correction, uh, or do we just continue to break out and get back to the trend that was uh, that was in place? Uh, each trend that uh, that is broken seems to continue on, uh, and off we go. Big question marks, right? But that's the name of the game uh, we play. Is is we make bets in the face of uncertainty. Earnings this week: uh, LSEG sixteen, SP Global fourteen, Sector Spider <laughs> fifteen. With so few, I mean, you'd think that a couple of them would be would have overlap, right? Forever, anybody out there listening that is paying these people big money for subscriptions uh i just want to keep reminding you they can't even get this right so you know you might want to rethink uh, how much you're paying them uh notables this week <clears throat> i think there's only one i mean really what's the market going to be this coming week a, a reflection on uh you know what we did on friday and ask ourselves did that make a lot of sense and everyone this is this is all it's going to be uh, is Nvidia, all right? Uh, uh, and this is Wednesday after the close. Um, I think so much of of this rally uh, of the last year and a half really comes down to AI, 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 uh, and is the build out still going at the pace uh, that it has been? So I think the focus will be here. And I don't know that the focus will be so much on the earnings as the forecast, because I believe uh, there is some uh, new platform that they're releasing that may affect current period sales because everyone's waiting for the next for the uh, newest releases. I, I, I think there's something there. I don't follow Nvidia that closely. Um, and to add to the tech space, you also have uh, Salesforce.com, you have CrowdStrike, and you have HP, and in the consumer staples, uh, JM Smucker. Uh, going into Thursday, Dollar General, uh, Lululemon, uh, Best Buy, you have uh, C oh, Campbell Soup, uh, CPB, look at, what, what's that again? Campbell Soup and uh, Autodesk going into Thursday. Um I don't know that any of those will matter. Uh, I think I think this sets the tone until the jobs report on on uh, on the following Friday. And if that comes in, uh, uh, you know where where it's been landing for the last little while, one eighty five to two hundred. I think you're looking at a twenty five basis point September cut, and that is uh, that is the week that was and the week that will be. Uh, so next week, uh, new positions, you'll have to look in the applied level for that. I'm going to try to get new positions up on Fridays, uh, sometime Friday afternoon, so that you have the weekend to think about new positions as opposed to putting them up Sunday. Um, because for some of you, it's the middle of the night. By the time you see this video, the week has already started. You haven't had time to do your own research and your own homework to determine whether or not those fit in with what you want to do. So I'll try to put them up Friday so you have the whole weekend uh, in the applied level. Uh, if you are a applied level subscriber, full level applied level subscriber as of July 31st, you just get these. They'll be in portfolio construction. If you are a subscriber after uh, July 31st, uh, you, do not, uh, you do not get new positions, but there will be uh, there will be an option to add it uh, if you want. I just don't know. I don't know what kind of demand uh, there will be uh, for it. So I don't want to, you know, invest a lot in the IT coding of it uh, if if there is no demand. So let me know in the comments section if this is something that you'd be interested in. If not, then then you know I could save everybody uh, on this side a lot of time by not coding anything. And that's it.